Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our second day of the Rural Child Hunger Summit. Um, my name is Chelsea McCormick. I work for No Kid Hungry on the Center for Best Practices team and am part of the planning committee for this year's summit. This next session is focusing on sustainable program design and utilizing community strength to build effective programming. And commonly when we think about sustainability of programming, we think about fiscal sustainability. And how do we have enough money to operate the programs that we want to run to the fullest potential that they have? And while fiscal security and programming is hugely important, program sustainability is larger than that. So today's session will focus on sustainability through the lens of community buy-in, um, through offering services that celebrate your local community and your local cultures, and continual feedback from program participants. The strategies shared today can create strong partnerships and successful programs that draw on those community strengths. So for today's session, we'll start um, by hearing about three different programs. Uh, firstly, we'll hear from Lisa Sakabasin from Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness in Maine. Following her, we have Jennifer Weaver from Perry County Food and Faith Coalition in Kentucky. And last but certainly not least is Silka West, the Food Service Director at Stinson ISD in Texas. After we hear from all of these amazing speakers, uh, we'll come together to answer some audience questions in a Q&A. So please enter any questions you have for our panelists into the Q&A box through today's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a true honor to be here with you all. I hope to tell you a story. I hope to give you a picture of how Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness does their job here in Wabanaki territory, territory that is now called Maine. So in Maine, we have four federally recognized tribes and many tribal citizens from all over the United States. We have the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy that make up the Wabanaki nations. Wabanaki meaning the people of first light or the people who greet the sunlight. At Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, I have the honor of leading. I am a Passamaquoddy citizen myself. And one of the things that we hold dear is our culture. How do we create a system that is, yes, sustainable, but also centers culture, self-determination, and a sustainable public health system? So we'll go on to the next slide and we'll start digging in on how we did it and very much looking forward to your questions. At Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, what we say is wherever you are on your journey, we have a place for you. We are creating systems that don't leave any person behind. We reach them where they're at. We develop a system that centers love and culture. And this is what we're creating here. Why is it so important on the next slide? This will not be a surprise to many of you. Our history has not been a kind one to us. The next slide we see Historical trauma. Historical trauma is that collective emotional and physio psychological inju injury, both over the lifespan and across generations, resulting in genocide. Dr. Yellow Horse Braveheart. We know that historical trauma has had its impacts. We see that in our data today. And while that is an important piece of the story, so is this next slide. On the next slide, you will see generational strength. Yes, we have a difficult history. And what we also have is power, is knowledge that was passed down through our language, through our culture, from our ancestors. And in our language and culture, it provides us everything that we need to know to heal, to connect, and to serve. Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness builds off this strength. These are our youth in the sacred Penobscot River. 
what we have at our organization is 140 people, 70% Indigenous, working closely together and with community to address the needs that they have, to develop and reach the dreams that have been identified by the community. When I joined Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness about four years ago, four years in June, we had less than 10 members on our team. Fast forward four years and we have 140 team members and many, many more programs to address the needs and the data that I suggest are impacts from historical trauma. What is so wonderful about addressing our generational strength is that it makes us smile. Our culture fulfills us. So developing programs that center that culture allows us to build on the strength and allows us to work with community to develop those deep needs. When we go on to the next slide, we're going to start to share some of our information on one of our divisions within our organization, the Division of Community and Land Wellness. This division is critically important to us. This is the division that focuses on nutrition, food sovereignty and security. And of course, that is directly related to the health of our, our mother, our earth, our environment. What we know is that our land heals. Our healing is in the land. And what we also know is that we've poisoned her. That there are places in Maine that you cannot grow fresh fruits and vegetables from the land directly because of contamination. We know that it is a deep responsibility to care for our land that we don't have a lot of time to do it. We also know that we need to be working across our divisions within our organization in order to address this issue. What we have at Wabanaki is a strong maternal child health program as well. Within that program, we have work around literacy and really connecting kids with books to learn, to learn from indigenous authors while they're also receiving some fresh fruits and vegetables. That cross collaboration and that destigmatization is important when you're thinking about sustainability. When we go on to the next slide, I wanna share with you a quote. In some native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. Robin Wall Kimmerer from Braiding Sweetgrass. This book offers an opportunity to connect to land in a deeper way to understand that we are living in relationship and we build our programs that are centered around this relationship. On to the next slide, I wanna share with you some of the plants and animals that help sustain us as indigenous people and has helped sustain us for over thousands of years. These are traditional foods that are local to this territory, Wabanaki territory. These are foods that we collect, that we collect, and we also serve to our communities. On the next slide, you're going to see that we also grow our own vegetables. We grow our own vegetables in our greenhouses, in our raised beds. Growing vegetables to us is a ceremony. We harvest seaweed from the ocean, we bring it inland, and we put that nourishment into the way we grow our vegetables. We believe bringing life is a ceremony, is sacred. We also believe the sacredness in which we treat these plants brings more healing. On to the next slide, please. More pictures of some of the vegetables and raised beds that we are active in growing, expanding the amount of food that we grow each and every year. The next slide on the same property, a property that is 50 acres along this Penobscot River. It allows for camping and walking and collecting some of these vegetables and fruits that I've already mentioned. Our medicine walk was a cross collaborative project with elders in our communities, as well as people in recovery and our young people. 
I really believe this is how we prevent substance use disorder. Walking alongside each other, centering culture, our young people learning about those people in recovery and how these medicines bring them wellness, bring them healing. We are working cross-generationally because what we know as Indigenous people is that these challenges that we are faced with are far too complex for any one generation alone. We need all voices at the table. We need to remember what heals us. And this medicine walk is a beautiful walk that I invite any of you to walk through. It's a guided tour that connects you to these medicines. Let's go on to the next slide. Some are here, our Eastern Sage, which is called Pearly Everlasting. We are growing our own tobacco again. When I was younger, I knew that tobacco was sacred and we use tobacco in ceremony. And oftentimes the tobacco that we used was tobacco that was in a can. Our nations didn't grow it at that time and we are now growing it. We now have a different relationship with tobacco. It's growing from our land. My young son now will never see tobacco in the can only from the earth. I now know what tobacco looks like at every stage of their development. We're making teas with dandelions. We are creating wellness for our community. Next slide, please. We must not forget the importance of clean water. Indigenous people across this country have much higher exposures to dirty water. Clean, safe drinking water is a privilege and not a privilege that every Indigenous nation is afforded. Dirty water in the Passamaquoddy community has been an issue for over 40 years, my lifetime. We are active in making sure that not only is food secured, but clean water is essential and also secured for our people. Next slide. I'd like to read you this quote by Sean Sherman, the Sioux chef. The Western culinary diet has never really taken the time to learn this vast amount of botany around us and all these plants are so giving to us. So if you look at the world through an indigenous lens, you're going to see so much food and medicine and shelter and crafting in just the plant life around you. This is how we view our land. Going back to sustainability for a moment before I wrap up, sustainability from an indigenous perspective is far more than the financial resources you need to carry out programs. Sustainability is seven generational thinking. Making sure what we're creating today for Wabanaki people is here for those generations that we may never meet. Making sure that people have access to the services we have and that healing is provided, perhaps in perpetuity. So how do we do this? Well, I believe we do this through meaningful community engagement. I believe you build that momentum and you listen to the community. You think about generational thinking, you are thinking beyond the people that you know today, and you're also having fun. Food is to be celebrated, not for people to be shamed. Food is fun, food is healing, and centering that in the work is important. Also relationships. Relationships are things to be tended just as our plants are to be tended. Strong relationships over time, a commitment to hearing what is being said and dreaming within community and coming up with solutions together is all sustainable practice. When I think about how do you replicate a public health system like this in other areas, I would say it's not about replication, but learning from the process. Those elements of the process that I believe should be inherent when working on issues of complexity. Making sure that the community is at the table, making sure the community holds that power. 
And lastly, making sure that we center both culture and love and non-judgment in all the work that we do. On the next slide, I wanna to say to Buolewan, I thank you for listening and I'm pretty excited to turn it over to Jennifer Weber to share what she has to share about her programming. To Buolewan, thank you. And thank you, Lisa, that was amazing. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Weaver, and I'm very happy to be with you here today and to have the opportunity to share with you one of the many food stories from my community of Perry County, Kentucky. I serve in some capacity with all the organizations listed on this slide. That's all of these logos. Um, I work for Community Farm Alliance under a grant that is a partnership with North Fork Local Food. In my role with these organizations, I collaborated with others in our community to create the Perry County Food and Faith Coalition. Through a partnership with the University of Louisville, we were selected to participate in Aetna Foundation's Healthiest Cities and Counties Challenge, which has provided us some of the resources to move our work forward. So as you may already be able to tell, a key component for our community in building sustainable programs is partnership. On our next slide, you will see some of the beauty of my community and the little town nestled in the mountains is Hazard, which is our county seat. So I wanna share a little bit about these organizations. The Food and Faith Coalition is addressing food insecurity through a variety of collaborative approaches. The group is comprised of community members from the faith, healthcare, education, um, local government, agriculture, nonprofit, business, and philanthropic sectors in our community. North Fork Local Food is a regional organization building and strengthening the local food system in Eastern Kentucky. Community Farm Alliance is a statewide membership organization supporting small-scale farming through advocacy, leadership development, and programming. And together, these organizations work at the nexus of hunger and local agriculture to address both food insecurity and economic development. In our next slide, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about our community, give you just a little bit of background. Um, we're located in the heart of the southeastern Kentucky mountains on the Cumberland Plateau. And as you can see, we are a fairly white, fairly impoverished community with a high rate of food insecurity and our children bear the brunt of this. On our next slide, we look a little bit of ag we look a little bit at agriculture. Um, there's a long history of subsistence farming that goes back to the Eastern Band of Cherokee when they stewarded the land for millennia before they were pushed out by white settlers. In 1959, in the 1959 Ag Census, about 70% of the land in our county was used for farmer operations with over 700 farms. Following this, there was a huge decline in farming as there was a huge increase in coal mining, um, particularly with regards to um, surface mining and mountaintop removal. Now in the last couple of decades, as coal mining has declined, agriculture has resurged. We are returning to our roots and agriculture is playing an increasingly important role in the diversification of our economy. In our next slide, though the data is a little bit old, you can see we are not the healthiest community. And though these stats um, are focused on the adult population, high rates of obesity and physical activity in our children and youth coupled with low rates of fruit and vegetable intake are producing increasing numbers of children and youth with type two diabetes, hypertension, and other chronic illnesses. Next slide. So in thinking about the key ingredients to building a sustainable program in our community, partnerships are what really stand out to me. They help us understand the need in our community. They help us to develop and implement strategies that are going to work. 
they increase equitable access, and they integrate the programs into the fabric of our community. So it's not just North Fork's program, it's a program of our community. And we have a number of key partners, aside from the three I mentioned at the outset, who are involved in this. Save the Children, the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, our local government, Cooperative Extension, um, our community college, clinics, our uh, K through 12 education systems, hospital, our churches, individual community members. We are working together to better our community. So now I wanna dig a little more into this food story as an example of how we have built these partnerships over the years. And while our story does not begin here by any stretch of the imagination, we're going to pick it up in 2015. The Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky brought together a number of community members to do some strategic planning. Um, and actually the top picture on the right is a picture from that session. Um, but the planning was around food, health, and the economy. And out of this discussion came two major um, items that uh, have relevance here. The first is that North Fork Local Food was created. And the second is that North Fork took over oversight of our farmer's market um, from tourism. And if we go into our next slide, um, have a picture of our farmer's market. At the time, at 2000, in 2015, it was about 10 years old. It was a loose group of farmers just taking cash and a bit off the beaten path in our Perry County Park. North Fork Local Food hired a market manager to bring some structure to the, man to the market. We began taking SNAP. We partnered with Community Farm Alliance to participate in Kentucky Double Dollars, which means that folks spending SNAP and Farmers Market Nutrition Program Assistance vouchers got double um, their purchases in fruits and vegetables. And in the subsequent years, we spent time building the market. And a huge part of this was intentionally building community through partnerships. Health clinics came and did screenings. The Wellness Coalition partnered with us to start a carrot cash program, which provided uh, little vouchers for uh, children to come to the market. Cooperative Extension did outreach on their programs and cooking demonstrations with the food available at the market. A local teacher started a story time for kids um, where healthy local snacks were served. Pathfinders of Perry County initiated hikes that started and ended at the market bringing new people into the market, but also encouraging people at the market to hike the trails on our beautiful mountains and, and get some physical activity and so much more. It was slow work, but we increased access to healthy food and we saw new and younger vendors and customers coming to the market. And we saw more organizations involved in the market. We really began to see a shift in how people viewed the relationships among local agriculture, health, food security, and the economy. Next slide. In 2020, we partnered with the city of Hazard to build a permanent pavilion for the farmer's market in downtown Hazard. And this location put us within walking distance of many neighborhoods, several of whom are low income neighborhoods. And while we all know that 2020 was a rough year, including for our farmer's market, what we found in 2021 was that some, so many of the seeds that we had been planting for years were beginning to grow and flourish. Um, we really got connected with Save the Children um, with the Farms to Families food box distributions. And so we partnered with them to sponsor our Carrot Cash program. So any child or youth coming to our farmer's market gets $4 to spend on fruits, vegetables, and a lean or lean protein. Um, they do activities at our market. Um, they make it fun. Kids can dig in dirt, read a story about growing carrots. Um, it's all, it, it's wonderful to have them there at the market. We have partnered with clinics in town to offer Fresh Rx for Moms, which is a produce prescription program for pregnant moms on Medicaid. And we're working with another clinic to start a produce prescription program this summer aimed at youth. We partnered with clinics and with our local diabetes coalition to offer diabetes dollars where providers in the community can actually prescribe 10 or $20 in diabetes dollars for folks to come down to the market and get fresh local produce. Between the time we were at the park and this past season in 2021, we saw a 200% increase in SNAP purchases at our market. I saw a lot of folks who live in neighborhoods surrounding the market coming down to get food and a huge increase in the number of families and children coming to the market 
It's been a great way to grow the market with all of the partnerships that we have had and continue to have. On our next slide, um, we get into another model. <clears throat> as much as we love the farmer's market, it doesn't reach everyone. And even with all the work that we're doing and all the community building that we're doing, it is still not going to reach everyone with healthy local food. In 2017, we heard about the Fresh Stop Market program operated by New Roots in the West End of Louisville. And there's some similarities between our communities, despite them looking quite different. Um, we have high rates of poverty and food insecurity, low access to grocery stores, isolation, the list goes on. And this model sounded interesting. It's a sliding scale CSA or farm share. Um, it has guest chefs to help folks figure out ways to use food. Um, it incorporated food justice, all sorts of wonderful things. Um, and the sliding scale is that um, secure income folks pay about $25, which is the cost of the share. Low income folks pay um, $12 and can use their SNAP card. Folks who have extra income and want to share that with their neighbors so they can eat healthy food can pay $40. But everybody gets the same amount of food, the same quality of food, the same types of food. So we put this, we plopped this down and did it like they did in Louisville and we absolutely failed. Next slide. We, however, were not about to give up. <clears throat> so after some introspection, we decided that what we needed to do was not emulate what went on in Louisville, but we needed to adapt it so that it fit our community, um, which is part is a key ingredient as far as we are concerned um, with making programs sustainable. And Lisa talked about this, but it is, it is making certain that the program fits the people, the landscape, the culture, it fits your community. So we tried out a few locations and we found our home downtown. We decided we needed anchor producers. So we work with a couple of farmers in January to plan out the year, um, plan out the season in the summer. And we know we're gonna get vegetables from them. They know they're gonna sell us vegetables. And then we fill in with other producers um, when they don't have enough or to get um, lean proteins or grains, which our community has said they want in their shares. Um, while we have offered new vegetables like kohlrabi that many folks around here haven't heard of, we also make certain that we have foods that people are familiar with and like to eat, like green beans, white half runners, greasy beans, um, all sorts of varieties, um, tomatoes, potatoes, corn, um, because that's what folks want to see. We partnered with community leaders, and I'm not talking about the elected type of community leader, the folks in communities that people look up to, to do outreach, to bring um, to talk to their communities about what they wanted to see and what we could do um, to meet those needs. And this was much more of a success. Um, we still weren't hitting our target audience, but we were as much as we wanted to, but we were seeing that more people were buying fresh, healthy local food. And our next slide, we you can see we kept at it, improving each year. And a real game changer for us came in 2020 when we partnered with the Mother of Good Council Church and Hazard Perry County Community Service, which is an organization create to, created to meet basic needs like feeding people. So Mother of Good Council purchased shares, Hazard Perry County Community Service, new families who needed food and delivered the shares out to hit them. So we were reaching families that could not come to market. This grew in 2021 when we partnered with Save the Children who both purchased the shares and then got them out to families in need throughout the county. We expanded Fresh Stop this last fall with Save the Children with a, a fall pilot because we had only done this in the summer and it worked. So right now we're in the middle of a spring pilot and actually about three hours from now, I'm gonna be bagging up um, uh, spinach and lettuce and all sorts of things for our Fresh Stop share tonight. But having those partnerships was essential for us to be able to reach people um, out in the communities. In the next slide, you can see how our program has gone, ha has been growing. You can see we don't even count 2017 when we look at statistics, but this is because we have meaningful and deep relationships with our community and with organizations within our community. And the program reflects who we are as a community. If we go into the next slide, 
This is the last part of the food story, our food story that I want to share with you today. And it's a project we just piloted and I am so excited about it. Um, it's a crock pot meal kit. And so we worked with Save the Children to fund this pilot, to identify families, and then their staff have gotten, have delivered these crock pot meal kits out to families in the community. And how it worked is that last summer and fall, we were purchasing produce from local farmers and we had it um, minimally processed at Heinemann Settlement School, so either frozen or canned. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see Emily Whitaker of Windy Hills Farm. That is butternut squash she grew, and she was so excited to see her farm name on that label and know that it was going to go into these Crock-Pot meal kits. This past winter, we, we created recipes, purchased meats from local farmers, developed spice blends, and did all the other little details that need to happen for a project like this. Then in February and March, we piloted six meal kits, one per week. With the first meal kit, each family received a crock pot. And then each meal kit during the week came with a recipe card. Um, and about half the meals also contained a let's get cooking together um, activity sheet that was based on the week's recipe, but includes um, um, activities to enhance numeracy and literacy skills for young learners. Um, and this came out of a leadership round table um, with one of our Save the Children staff here in our community when we were talking about how ways we can creatively help kids prepare for kindergarten. Um, each meal kit also came with other add-ins, um, local bread, local cookies, cheese, sausage, that sort of thing to really round it out. And this ended up being a great way to feed kids, get families cooking together, work on kindergarten, kindergarten readiness skills, and provide income to our local farmers. We are growing this um, with another pilot in partnership with our local hospital um, to do this, to offer meal kits to their employees. And we are currently negotiating with one of our state Medicaid providers to pilot a meal kit program with them that they could use with some of their members being discharged from the hospital. And so I think this has a lot of potential to grow and provide sustainability. And this really, to me, is um, a shining example of the work done over the last few years to build and deepen and strengthen partnerships in our community and make programs work for our community. So on the next slide, um, my colleague, Anthony Ritchie, um, could not join us today, but there is his information and my information. We are looking forward to creating the next chapter of our food story by continuing our work, by continuing our partnerships and listening and talking and being with our community. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity to tell our story and for taking the time to listen to it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Silka. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Silka West with Sentin ISD in the Coastal Plains area of Texas. It is a great honor and opportunity to be with you today. And I'm excited to share with you a unique lens and perspective. We've heard about some amazing programs already. And I get to share with you the lens from a very hot topic in a very hot area and that is hunger and food and nutrition for children, especially uh, with all the legislation and regulation in place when it comes to school meal programs. So it is my opportunity to share with you um, some information related to that, and thank you for being here today. Okay, we're going to our next slide where knowing about your community. Being from Sentin ISD, we are a small rural community situated in the coastal plains of Texas, not far from Corpus Christi. And when I say coastal plains, we have our farmers and we have our ranchers. And what's very unique about our location, not only are we small, about 2000 to 2200 students, we're rural, and we also have farmland and ranch land. So our children in our community are used to seeing crops that are grown to feed animals and livestock, or um, such as the grain that's grown for livestock. They're also used to seeing cotton. We have cotton fields and we have grain fields, and that's what they're most used to seeing. Um, on their bus rides or their rides to school and back home. 
it's not common for our children to see fresh grown food. And so hearing about the programs before, um, it, it's wonderful because personally, I live on a ranch and I'm very lucky that my husband gardens one acre of our ranch dedicated to fresh food. So I have a passion for fresh food and I have a passion for bringing that information to our children, especially in our small rural community. So knowing our community is very important in all programs, whether you're with a school district, whether you're with a nonprofit organization in the public private sector, knowing our community is very, very important. And for us, our community, Sentin ISD is 79% Hispanic, which has um, a large impact on the menu choices that we offer our children. But that's not only the only demographic variable that has a large impact impact on our children, a large portion of our, our uh, parents are in the millennial age. Our native citizens are around the average age of 29 years old. And so a lot of the children that we have in our school district have millennial parents. And we have a very unique situation and learning our children and learning our parents' expectations of not only our school meal program, but what the community offers for their families. So I'd like to share with you, how did we learn about our community? You know, I've been fortunate to be with Sentin ISD. This is my fifth year. And when I first came into the district, which was, which was very unique to me, I've lived in Sentin community for over 12 years. But because of my previous employment, I traveled. I didn't even shop in my own community. And when I became the food service director here at Sentin ISD, I realized I really didn't know a lot about my own community because I had traveled so much that I didn't get to spend a lot of time in my own community. So it was very important to me to sit and have good, substantial conversations with some key community individuals as well as district individuals. So how did I start learning about our community and getting to know our community? It's through those key stakeholder conversations, you know, meeting with some of our parents, meeting with our principals, having conversations about, tell me about your, you know, tell me about your child and your child's way of eating or your child's interest in eating, learning about the family dynamic and how the families um, eat. And then, as I shared with you, learning and discovering that our children in our community are familiar with food from the perspective of it is what they feed their animals. It's their chore every day. They go home and they feed their animals, whether it's horses, cows, goats, chickens, um, pigs. I mean, we have it all. But our children did not know a lot about fresh food. They identified food as what you just go buy at the grocery store. So learning a little bit about our families from that perspective, I grew to know more about our community. I grew to know that our community does have a low income. Um, we are right now, currently as of our March data, we're looking at 58% free reduced. We are in a community that was impacted heavily by Hurricane Harvey in 2017, 2018. And so, our community from that perspective um, went through a lot. You know, it, it was something very unique to our situation. And we had a lot of families that were homeless during that time. So it completely turned our community um, around to a very uncomfortable situation for about a two year period. So as we learned a little bit more about um, our families being on the lower income side, we also learned that a lot of our families only have one vehicle. And being that we're in the coastal area and we're about 30 miles from Corpus Christi, I also learned through some of those key stakeholder conversations that a lot of our families choose not to travel beyond Sinton, where our own community is, because they're the bigger city of Corpus Christi or driving across the huge bridge that goes across the bay is intimidating and uncomfortable. So they will choose to stay inside our own community to shop, to source resources, food or clothing or 
materials, anything that they may need, they try to stay inside. A lot of them do. Part of that is because of the one car household situation where the person that's working outside of the household has the vehicle, has access to the vehicle, and then the rest of the household members are here in the community. So it was very interesting to learn that about our community and knowing our student demographics. So in the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about our, how did we start to engage our community once we learned a little bit about them. We were really looking at our program, our school meal program internally as becoming a larger partner in the community, not just being a school meal program that simply just provides meals for children when they are in school, but becoming more aware of our community and becoming a larger partner, both internal in our own district, being that we're the school meal program, we wanna be a good partner while we're here inside our district, but also how can we be a partner in this community? So we really started looking at ways to engage our community. How can we increase our conversations? How can we increase our engagement? And so we identified some wonderful opportunities here in our community in Sinton. We have a Sinton for Youth program, which is not just high risk youth, but it is youth who maybe do not have access to guardianship when the family member is away at work after the school day has ended or maybe during extended breaks. So there's this large Sinton for Youth program that's operated inside our community. So we got to know our Sinton for Youth program. Also, being that we are in the agricultural coastal plain area and Sinton ISD is inside San Patricio County, we also are in the county seat for our um, agriculture in the area. So we have a huge agriculture show every single year that area youth beyond our district are brought into the community. And so they get to see a little bit about Sinton ISD and they get to see a little bit about Sinton, Texas when they're here in our community. So we wanted to really look at how do we become a good partner when these additional children are in our community? Um, we are very involved in our Sinton ISD health fair, our annual health fair, because again, as I shared with you early on, not a lot of our children understand about their food consumption source. They're very familiar with the agriculture that's grown to feed livestock or to make um, clothing, but they're not familiar with nutrition. And that is something I learned very early on in some of those stakeholder conversations. So we connect with our health fair every single year and we connect with some of our vendors and we solicit donations and we take time to go out in the health fair and really sit and have great conversations and do activities with our parents and the children during that time to try and connect them to more information about nutrition beyond what we already do in our school meal programs. And I'll share some of those examples with you as well. We also have um, community engagement across our, our, our little town here. The community gets together every year for a big, huge spaghetti dinner. And it's, it's an annual thing and it is a tradition in this, in this city, in this town. And so we are a partner at that table. We make sure that we are able to help our community get through that activity because we know it's going to happen every year. We know it's huge for our community and we wanna be a partner that can help support them and get them through that activity, as well as it's a great opportunity for us to connect with um, the parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles of all of those wonderful children that come to our district every single day that we have the opportunity to provide a meal for. We also have our annual homecoming parade that is a wonderful small town parade where everybody lines the main street in town. And so to be a partner at the parade is a great opportunity for our nutrition department, our school meal program nutrition department to be um, in the community, to be seen and to show that we are a partner and we're here to support our children. And then also one that was um, discovered during the pandemic that we had not been a partner to before, but became a partner with during the pandemic and now a sustainable partner is our San Patricio County Emergency Management District. 
And so I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, so let's go to our next slide and let me share with you about some of our celebrations because that's where I can share with you some of these wonderful activities that we have done as part of our community engagement piece. So um, we have a unique opportunity here in Sentinel ISD to be engaged with the community through some of the activities I, or some of the partnerships I just shared with you. But what are some of the activities that we have done as a result of those partnerships? Well, in having those stakeholder conversations with parents, with some of our older students and with some of our principals, we did a pretty radical menu change here in Sentin ISD as a result of the surveys, the face-to-face -face conversations and the stakeholder community meetings that we had. Because what I learned as the food service director here is not only do our children not get out to some of these outlying communities, we, we have a Dairy Queen here, we have a water burger here, and that's what our children know as far as um, fast food. But being that our children see a lot on television, I learned through those stakeholder conversations that our children really wanted more variety. And maybe that sounds very repetitive and common knowledge, but I heard it loud and clear here in those stakeholder conversations our children really wanted more variety. They see so much when they do pull up to a drive-through or they do go to maybe a local restaurant or they're seeing the commercials on TV and they really wanted that opportunity. So we did, we did some radical menu changes and we gave every campus has multiple menu choices. And as a result of that, we had direct increase in meal participation immediate. I mean, from one day to the next and continue and, con and it continued to build, which is a wonderful celebration and success story for us. And then looking at that, how do we keep that sustainable? How do we continue to do that? Well, through that community engagement piece, we continue to survey our stakeholders. For our little ones, we're mostly surveying our parents. But when it comes to the older ones, we do selective panels and we do bring student advisory groups together and we train them first that they are the voice of their campus and that they have responsibilities and they agree to that. They kind of take an oath. They agree to being that representative. Then we give them assignments. And they go out and they're so very proud to be able to carry out their assignments. And then they bring information back when we do our taste testings, when we do our follow-up meetings, and they bring information back to us about what the pulse of the campus is. We also still survey our older students. So we definitely take that opportunity to still connect with the individual student, but we do use our student advisory groups as a facilitation process to make decisions based on what survey results are, what the pulse of the campus is, what we're hearing. And so when we look at doing these things, we look at what can we continue to do that will be um, a celebration in our children's eyes? You know, what is it that they enjoy so that every day when they come to meal service with us, they feel like it's a celebration. They feel um, that enjoyable experience. And that's what we want. We know that we're here to provide nutrition. We have that unique, wonderful opportunity to do that. And we're so lucky to have that opportunity, but we want it to be a celebration every day that they have a good connection with food and nutrition and that they enjoy their environment. So one of the things that we learned during the pandemic was that yes, there was nutrition gaps in our community. Um, definitely, and that happened all across our nation. So I know that's not unique to just our, our community, but we did consult with our stakeholders and our families and our children during that time. And we learned a lot about what was the nutrition gap? What were they craving or missing or wanting that just if we could connect to that, how would that help them feel a little more comfort? How would that help them feel a little more um, upbeat and cele celebratory during a time of high stress during the pandemic. So we reached out to some grant partners and we were very fortunate to become a grant partner through the No Kid Hungry Grant through TREA. 
And through that grant, we took a unique opportunity to survey our parents, our families, our students, and our campuses. And we identified that our main focus during that time was to fill the nutrition gap of our children. And how were we going to do that? We decided to do that by being able to provide food for our children when they were not in session in school. And so we were already providing a breakfast meal program, a school lunch program, and an after school snack program. But with the pandemic and, and just any time during the school year, our children are out during extended breaks. And so they're out during um, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, spring break, and then of course, summer break. And we wanted to look at how could we fill that nutrition gap and then also leverage this unique opportunity not only just through this grant, but building this partnership and now building a program, how could we leverage that opportunity to start integrating nutrition education and really take that opportunity to start informing and educating our kids about their food source, about the importance of nutrition, where their food comes from, and then helping them learn more about what they can do to be involved in the care of their selves, their families, and their own nutrition intake. So what you're seeing on this slide is a picture of one, just one of the many grant activities that we did. But we implemented fresh fruit and vegetable programs at our schools. We provided nutrition snack bags during those holiday breaks. So like the Friday before we left out on Thanksgiving break or the Friday before we left out on Christmas break and then the Friday before we left out on spring break, we packed a nutrition snack bag for every child in our district. And in that snack bag was healthy, nutritious foods, because we wanted to use that opportunity to educate them about continuing their health and wellness and nutrition when they were away from school, as well as making sure that we could fill the hunger gap for them. So the picture that you're seeing here, we did, we hosted a huge nutrition day called Taste the Rainbow. And so we took this opportunity to work with some of our local produce providers for donations as well as some of our community stakeholders for nutrition education materials, and as well as our grant partner through some of our grant funds to put together the rainbow snack bags for our students. And that's what you're seeing here. It was Taste a Rainbow. It had the red, orange, yellow, green, and purple fruits in it. And then we had our nutrition education piece. That is one of our big celebrations. We also have the big celebration of providing emergency meal services as a result of the pandemic. And um, that was coordinating directly with San Patricio County Emergency Management District. We received a phone call in the district that our town was pretty much going to be shut off from food service. No trucks could come in. Our one and only local grocery store was not going to receive any groceries for more than three weeks. We had a senior citizen shelter that had no electricity, no way to cook. They had no way to feed their children. Red Cross could not get to um, our community in a timely manner. So our food service department reached out to our No Kid Hungry grant partner, as well as Texas Department of Agriculture for approval to be able to serve our community during that crisis. And so that's one of our celebrations as well. Next slide, please. So grant opportunities, when we talk about sustainability, you know, it was shared that it's not just financial and fiscal, but there are grant opportunities out there. And I do like to just take this, or I would like to take this opportunity to share with people that if you seek it, you may find a wonderful opportunity out there that you did not know of. And you could find potential um, fiscal support through these grants, USDA, TDA, No Kid Hungry. There are so many other partners out there, Dairy Max, uh, fuel up to play 60 healthier generation. There is a world of grant opportunities out there. And I understand not every grant fits every partnership and every community and every situation. But what is wonderful is learning about your community and then looking at the grant opportunities that are out there and looking to see can you bring a grant into your operation that will allow you to connect with children, connect them through nutrition education, maybe connect by fighting food insecurity and filling the nutrition gap, 
um, and helping them move forward. And so I, I want to take that opportunity to just encourage to explore grant opportunities. Don't be scared of them. Yes, they can be intimidating, but they're also so rewarding and it can be so worth the time. So in our next slide, you know, I'd like to just take a little bit of an opportunity to share with us about reducing stigma in school meal programs. And, you know, if you're a school meal program operator, or maybe you're not, and you're a stakeholder who has a child in a school meal program, it is, it, there, our school meal programs sometimes do come with some stigma. And so we want to take this opportunity to just share if we can do things to reduce that stigma, it helps our children overall. So perhaps making all lines reimbursable, increasing menu variety so that um, your, your demographics, your children feel included. And one of the fun things we do here in our district is once a month, we incorporate favorite a la carte items as part of our meal option so that those children that don't maybe have money to buy some of the a la carte items, get that through their meal. All right, next slide, please. So we have some community stakeholders at the table, our school health advisory committee, our school wellness committee, and we have our local wellness plan. And our next slide, please. What are some of the things that we do in our district to help care for our employees who are helping care for the children every single day? We celebrate National School Lunch Hero Day. We celebrate National Food Service Employee Day, Employee Appreciation Day, and we take advantage of every fun, spontaneous, and endless opportunity that we can. So I know that we're getting close to our time. So in the next slide, please. I just wanna share with you like replication of possibilities. Um, I love what was shared earlier that sometimes we try to go out and replicate exactly what's in a community that we saw and we're like, oh, that's a great idea. I wanna do just that. What I encourage first before you try to replicate exactly what's in a community is know your community. Sit down and have those conversations with stakeholders and then replicate in a way that fits your community. And so surveying, having those conversations and then research are all key. So I thank you for my time with you and opportunity. And I believe we're gonna go into our Q&A section next. Hi, yes, thank you so much. So you, Jennifer and Lisa, you guys provided such amazing content for us to um, talk about here and so many amazing programs that you shared. Uh, we have just a little bit of time left in this uh, presentation. I do wanna encourage people in the audience, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A box. Anything that we're not able to cover here, uh, we'll follow up with our lovely panelists and see what they're able to provide is um, written communications but I wanted to just ask one question here. You all presented such amazing programs, fully fledged, you know, you presenting a lot of learnings within them. Um, and it might be occasionally a little bit intimidating for people of like, oh, I want to do that, but I don't know that first step to take. Um, so I was wondering if I can get from each of you, just how, what is that first step you would recommend to any organization looking to build new programs and thinking sustainably about those programs and how to bring in their communities. What is that first step you would suggest? Um, I'm gonna put it over to Lisa first and then we'll go around the clock here. Yeah, I think that first step is before you have an idea about a program, before you wanna design anything is being community. I think any one of us, when we think about our communities, when we look out our windows, we know what the issues are. I understand as a former epidemiologist, the importance of data and what data can bring us in terms of knowledge and communities. And I often see what it doesn't bring us. And oftentimes it's those faces, those voices of people who have been, well, let's just face it, invisible in our society, whether it's people living in poverty, indigenous people like myself or others, oftentimes we're not visible in the data and you need to be in community to hear our stories because they're not the ones often highlighted. So, you know, get to know what 
the issues are for the communities? How can you partner bringing their dreams to reality? How do we switch it? So we're actually saying, because this is what we do, we go into the communities, what dreams do you have? And how can we help you get there? Are sometimes the questions that um, are left unasked. It's, I have this idea, let me then go to the community to tell them my great idea. And it really is quite the opposite. Willie one, thank you. Well, thank you. I love that. Going to the community for their dreams is so important. And Jennifer, you spoke to that a bit in your presentation. What was that kind of first step you guys took when you started to do that community planning together? It it really, uh, I, Lisa said it so well, um, going into your community and, and um, being in your community, being with your community, thinking about, um, thinking about what folks need and what, and what you're hearing. Um, I would also say that, um, and I am guilty of this, we are, I think we have the tendency of wanting to do it all now. And um, that it is, it took us a long time to get all of our part. It took us a long time to get to where we are and we've got a lot more work to do, um, but to bite off reasonable chunks um, to set expectations, to set your dreams, but then set your expectations of this is what I can reasonably accomplish with my community this month or this year or this week. I love that. And I thank you so much, Jennifer, for also sharing with us when it fails. You know, we learn a lot from those failures. Um, I've had programs that have failed before. I think we all can agree in that. We learned so much in that moment of like, oh, this didn't fit with my community, but there are so many other amazing ways that it could. Mm -hmm. um, I want to pass it over to Silka here. There was a question in the chat, and I think it really relates to this of that first step you take. And people are wondering with you, how do you get in contact with your school community? Do you have liaisons? Do you work with teachers and administrators? Who are kind of those other people you bring into that work with you? In our district, we do have a public communications officer. So that was my first step. Um, working with my public communication officer and then with each individual principal in our campus because our principals are our administrators and they know who their loudest voices are on their campus, whether it be a parent, administrator, a staff member. And so I made those direct connections first, sat down and had stakeholder conversations with them. And from that, I began the journey to visiting with the next stakeholder and then bringing everybody together at the table. Thank you so much. That was so important to share. Um, before I close this out here, we have a couple of other questions that are coming into the chat and I will share those with you guys after our session, but I just wanted to give a moment for any closing remarks, any final statements you want to make, but what are you really wanting people to walk away from this session with? Um, and I will start with Jennifer. Um, I, I, I think it has been an honor to be here and to be on the panel with Lisa and Silka. Um, and I want folks to follow their dreams and um, live in their communities and um, uh, be creative in how you address the needs and how, um, and the projects and programs that you put together. Thank you. Lisa, do you want to provide some closing remarks? Yeah, mine was around dreaming too, that dreaming works and collective dreaming is pretty powerful because when you have a collective dream, you already have others that are helping lift that, that heavy weight that needs to be lifted to, to launch. I also believe that an abundance mindset is not only important, it is 100% necessary. We have to step away from scarcity mindset thinking. Step away from those one grant here, one grant there thinking. But really think, what do we need to do to solve the issues around hunger, food insecurity, 
homelessness, you name it. What do we, what do we, what is that collective dream? Without scarcity, I, I am, I'm done with this will be good enough. I really think people are worth that abundance. And, and it just might happen that you get the support to create that abundance. And that's been our experience. And I would say happy dreaming. Thank you so much. And just to close us out here, Silke, do you want to join in this collective dream and share your final remarks as well? I am in complete agreement. I am a dreamer. And I believe that no dream is too small and that together we can make things happen. So I love what Jennifer and Lisa both had to share regarding dreaming and that everyone is worth it. So no matter how small you may feel your dream is, or no matter how small you feel like your first step is, that step, that dream can make a difference in someone's life. Don't be afraid to take it. Thank you all so much for sharing your passion and your creativity with us here today. And I think everyone walking away from the session will have so much to learn and to think about. Um, any questions that came in through the chat, I will share with you all um, after the summit. But thank you so much for being here and we will pass over. We've got a break coming up and then we will have our final session of the summit shortly. So thank you all for joining us here today. Market, uh, with four different communities that partner together all to try to provide fresh fruit and vegetables to our communities that are in a food desert. And so all of us came together, all the mayors and partners kind of came up with this plan. And so Save the Children gave us a grant to actually help with that process. So we're able to get food boxes uh, to be delivered here from Jackson. Might have things you know, like cabbage, they might have squash, bell pepper, all the different things that they can't get to readily. The Mississippi Delta is different from any other part of the state. I find that they lack resources for children. They lack access to healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. And they also lack age appropriate books in their homes. Recently, there was some bad flooding here in the Mississippi Delta. A lot of families lost everything in this flooding. Save the Children was able to come up and provide all types of resources, um, food, pampers, toys, books, school supplies. So we're really impacting not just children in the Mississippi Delta, but families also. In the classroom, a child needs food to be able to think. I tell people all the time, your body can't make ATP. It can't make energy without having the right nourishment inside of your body. So those kids need those fresh fruit and vegetables to make sure that they're able to have a good thought process. Say the children, I appreciate them every bit, every step of the way, ever since they started. My child was in school, she was in Save the Children. She was having a problem with her reading. Once she, once she got to Save the Children and they was receiving books that she liked, she became more into reading. Her reading has improved. Her comprehension has, has improved. Her communication has improved. So I really do appreciate them. It's a tight-knit community, and they work together for the benefit of each other. So uh, although it might not be rich in money, but it's rich in love and history.